Good morning, Greg 12. Um, carrying on with genetic engineering, but in fact, I'm actually going to go back a few slides because when I spent yesterday thinking about the process as I described yesterday morning when I um, recorded yesterday morning's lesson, I thought that there was a little part that I could add in which would probably make it a bit more understandable for you. So just quickly reminding you that DNA is cut using restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes or restriction endonucleases or endonuclease enzymes, all of them refer to the same thing. Um, cut DNA at specific points called recognition sites. And so remember that this particular um, restriction endonuclease recognizes this sequence of nucleotides, AATT, and it cuts it at that particular site, but it always cuts it in a way that is jagged. It cuts the sugar phosphate backbone, in this case between the G and the A, and it cuts across the hydrogen bonds and then it cuts down again the sugar phosphate backbone between the G and the A. And that leaves a sticky end here and a sticky end here. And, and this is the part that was left out. So that when two pieces of DNA that have been cut with the same restriction enzyme are put together, then they have complementary sticky ends. So this would be DNA from a donor gene, from a donor organism, it would be a donor gene, and this would be um, DNA in a recipient organism. And because they're cut by the same restriction enzyme, these sticky ends are complementary. And so when they are put together with a ligase enzyme, they are able to form hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. And what has now been formed is recombinant DNA. In other words, DNA that has um, parts of DNA from two different organisms put into it. So this was the original DNA in the red, and this is the donor gene in the blue, and now the DNA as a total is called recombinant DNA. So DNA that has been formed artificially become combining constituents from different organisms is called recombinant DNA. Um, it is critical that the two pieces are cut by the same restriction enzyme, as different restriction enzymes have different recognition sequences. And so if the DNA, the two pieces, were cut with different restriction enzymes, their sticky ends would not be complementary and they wouldn't be able to join. And so I just wanted to show you that um, here are three different restriction enzymes. You do not have to know them. And what you can see is that the recognition sequences are different. So this one goes for GGATCC. And it cuts there, and the sticky end will be GATC, and the sticky end will be CTAG. But this restriction enzyme cuts at A between A and A of AAGCTT. And it will leave a different, different sticky end, because the sticky end will be AGCT. Okay. And then ECO01, this is a very commonly used one at AA. T, T, with a G there and a C there. Okay. Right. So I spoke about this yesterday. Um, then I also added in this particular slide um, to explain why quite often they would need to make glow in the dark organisms. Now, 
This refers to something called marker genes. And marker genes are important because it's not as easy to insert a gene into another organism as it sounds. And it's quite a hit and miss affair. So if, for example, one tries to insert genes into, say, 100 different organisms, it might work on 10. So it's not as easy as it sounds. And it might be expensive and it might be time consuming because after having put the genes into an organism, then there's the whole process of raising the organism. Um, if, if, for example, the genes were put into a crop plant, then planting a whole field of this crop and then discovering that only one tenth of them had the actual gene that they were trying to insert into it. And it's also not easy to determine if the gene has been taken up. In other words, if the recipient has been transformed. And then even more time and money might be spent on growing organisms while they're in genetic engineering. And then after all of that, it might be found that none of the recipients have been transformed, which would be a waste of time and money. So one of the ways around this is to add what is called a marker gene to the gene from the donor before trying to insert the donor gene into the recipient. So the marker gene is like a little label. For example, if a scientist was trying to put a gene into a tomato plant, then enable that tomato plant to grow in salty soil. So soil that is normally not ideal for growing tomato plants um, or growing any plants, and therefore is quite a barren piece of soil. Um, then if that gene has added to it a glow-in-the-dark gene before it's inserted into the recipient plant, then um, it can be used to determine if the recipient has been transformed. So let's say a person tried to put in a grown salty soil gene into 500 tomato plants, little seedlings, and wanted to know which ones to actually now plant into the salty soil. If before the gene was added in, the glow in the dark gene was added in, and then trying to transform those 500 plants, then to see which plants had actually taken up the gene and been transformed, it would merely require um, switching off the normal lights, switching on special lights, such as black lights, and those recipients that did glow had been transformed while the process didn't work for those that didn't glow. And here you can see um, some little, little like rats um, where, <coughs> sorry, three of them have been transformed and three of them haven't been transformed. Then only these three would be used from then on and these three wouldn't be. Okay. So there are different ways of transferring genes from one organism to another organism. And the first me method of gene transfer, and I spoke about this yesterday morning, is what are called bacterial plasmids. And bacterial plasmids are often used to transfer genes. Um, I spoke about this, I described it, and I said um, the restriction enzyme has cut out this donor gene, there's a sticky end, there's a sticky end, and the plasmid has been taken out of the DNA, out of the bacterium and has been cut with the same restriction enzyme, leaving the sticky end and that sticky end. And when they're put together with the ligase enzyme, the ligase glues the two sticky end pieces together. Glues is maybe not an ideal word. Okay. All right, so we, that I described yesterday morning. Now, depending on what the researcher or scientist or whatever wants to do with the donor gene, this in fact might be an end point of the entire process. Um, I described this yesterday. <clears throat> I 
to remember and you understand. I said do activity 5.17 in the textbook, page 134. So this could be the end point. And I'm going to give you some examples of when this is the end point. But in some cases, um, the bacterium that is now, because this plasmid is put together with bacteria, and it will be reabsorbed by the bacteria. And then that bacterium can be used as a vector. This is an important word you have to know. To carry the desired gene into another organism. So let's say in that tomato plant that I wanted to transform to be able to grow in salty soil, the bacterium carrying the gene could be used to infect that tomato plant, and then the tomato plant would get the desired gene via the bacterium. So one example of a situation where the bacterium with the plasmid that is recombinant um, is the end point of the process, is making insulin. Now, historically, insulin used to be, many, many years ago, used to be extracted from the pancreas of dead organisms. So, for example, pigs that had been slaughtered or meat eating, the pancreas was extracted and insulin was taken from those pancreases and it was put into little bottles and it was sold to humans who diabetics and needed insulin. And that was the only way that insulin was able to be um, obtained. And it was great, and most, for most diabetics it worked very well. But for some diabetics, pig insulin or cow insulin did not work ideally. And now, scientists have worked out a way of producing human insulin. Not from humans, though. So what they have done is they have taken bacteria down at the bottom left here, and they've extracted the plasmids from those bacteria and cut the plasmids open using a restriction enzyme. But they've also taken human pancreas cells, and now this is human, extracted the gene for making insulin, human insulin, because it came from a human cell, and put it together with the ligase enzyme and the cut plasmid, and they've made recombinant DNA. Destroying the wrong way around. This should be blue and that should be red. Ah, well, doesn't matter. So this is now a recombinant plasmid. That recombinant plasmid is mixed together with some bacteria, and bacteria very readily take up plasmids. And so it becomes a recombinant bacterium. And this bacterium has a human insulin gene in it. And the nice thing about bacteria, as you remember from last year, bacteria are able to reproduce asexually by binary fission. And so very soon this recombinant bacterium has divided into millions of bacteria that are clones because it was asexual reproduction. And these bacteria all contain a gene for making human insulin. And they're grown in a tank. And what happens is they constantly, by protein synthesis, because here's the gene for making human insulin, they constantly make human insulin. And that human insulin then is extracted and purified. Oh, purification is spot and free. I didn't do that. And then bottled in little vials of human insulin and sold. And the nice thing is 
that people can't be allergic to this because it's human insulin. So there's an, an example of medical application of recombinant, using recombinant DNA in bacteria. And scientists use um, this process to produce lots and lots and lots and lots of different proteins, including the human growth hormone um, and some other things. Okay. So that's one example. Okay. So now you need to know what biotechnology is because it says so in your sex. And biotechnology, you know, the technology is any um, process where a human's life is made easier because of something that has been developed um, by a scientist or something like a cell phone is an example of technology. Biotechnology is the use of plants or animals or microorganisms such as yeast or bacteria to produce useful products. For example, food, medicines, clothing, or biological washing powder. So yeast is used to make the dough of bread rise, which makes bread not hard, um, it's soft and easy to eat. Um, cheese is um, made using quite often um, a little protein called rennet, which um, causes the, the, the milk of the cheese to go sour and separate, um, and, then, and then cheese is made. And that enables the milk that was used originally to be eaten for a much longer period of time, the same as yogurt. So yogurt has bacteria that makes it go sour. Yogurt is actually more easy to digest than, than milk is. And it, it lasts a lot longer than milk does. Um, and there are lots of applications of biotechnology and it has been used for a long, long time. So this is biotechnology on a grand scale. So these are the bioreactors, the big fermentation tanks in which the recombinant bacteria for making insulin are grown and then can be extracted. And the name of one of the kinds of human insulin is humulin. All right. There are lots of different ways in which these bacteria can be used. There's even bacteria that has been engineered to digest oil spills. And so, whereas oil spills used to be from tankers, for example, that had run aground or had developed leaking tanks in the sea and spilled the oil, and now little bacteria can be added and it can digest this because oil doesn't break down and it would be pollution on this beach for many, many years. But in other cases, the transformed bacteria can be used as a vector. It can be used to carry the desired gene into another organism where the gene is added to the genome of the recipient. And the recipient then also becomes transformed. And the DNA of plants can also be altered to produce all sorts of things. For example, disease resistant or insect resistant crops or more appealing produce. So the bacterium and the recombinant plasmids are both termed vectors, genetic vectors in the case of genetic engineering, are vehicles, are ways of delivering foreign DNA into recipient cells. Um, because bacteria and viruses easily take up foreign DNA. Um, they, and, and other organisms don't easily take up foreign DNA. Bacteria and viruses can be used to carry the desired genes into recipient organisms. So this is an example, a description of a way in which um, strawberry plants, for example, can be 
transformed using the bacterium. So um, what happens here is there's a bacterium called Agrobacterium chimifaciens that actually produces um, a pest resistant gene. So the plasmid is removed from the bacterium. It's cut by a specific restriction enzyme. Um, the desired gene for pest resistance is cut with the same restriction enzyme. The desired gene is inserted into the plasmid here and makes a recombinant plasmid, which is then taken up again by bacteria, a different bacterium to this one. And the plasmid then, it's a recombinant plasmid and a recombinant bacterium. And the bacterium then is used to infect the strawberry plant and it carries the little gene, the desired gene into the strawberry plant. Now the strawberry plant contains the desired gene. And plants have a property different to animals. Every single cell of a plant is able to grow into a different kind of cell. It's able to differentiate and form any kind of cell in the plant. So the plant that became transformed is cut up into very, very tiny pieces called explants. And they are put on the nutrient medium in an agar plate. And each of them, little, each of those little pieces de-differentiates into a callus and it grows and it is able to then be grown. It goes through a series of growth chambers um, being put onto different media with different hormones and eventually it grows into a normal strawberry plant. Now this is a clone of the original transformation form strawberry plant because this microculturing is a method of making cloned plants and if a plant is grown from a cell that is um, transformed then every single one of its cells is transformed and will express this new characteristic or tray and so this plant will be genetically modified and it will be able to um, resist pests like little caterpillars that you produce and whatever. So if one looks for data to see how much um, of the plant produce in South Africa is genetically modified, apparently um, South Africa grows, commercially grows three commercial crops that have been genetically modified, mainly for herbicide and insect tolerance our maize, cotton, and soya. But there is an organization called BioWatch South Africa, which is interested in food security as a whole, but biosafety in the country. And they report that field trials have been carried out on genetically modified potatoes, wheat, canola, sugarcane, apple, eucalyptus, strawberry, beet, tomato, and sweet potatoes. Um, so these would probably become crops that are grown commonly in the future. The reason why, um, so insect tolerance, obviously you understand, herbicide resistance. Now herbicide is something that kills weeds. And so it's quite important that um, crops with um, weed killer resistant genes are developed. So what happens is that crop can then be sprayed or the field could then be sprayed with a herbicide resistance, a herbicide, sorry, not herbicide resistance, a herbicide and the crop plants will survive but the weeds will die. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. And then just the last one, so genes can be inserted into plant cells um, using a particle or a gene gun. So this is an alternative to using um, the 
the bacterial method. And here what happens is the, the tiny little particles that are coated with DNA, which contain the desired genes, and they are put into what is called a particle gun. And they are shot, the little particles are shot at plant pieces. And quite often then DNA is actually taken up into the little pieces of plant. And then the process carries on as normal. Once the plant cells have been transformed, then they can be cloned and they can be grown into a whole um, new plant. And so this is particle gun here. Um, so there's a little plastic disc with DNA coated gold particles, and they are shot at the target plant cells and might be taken up. And this would also be one way we, you don't want to grow all these plants here or all these plants here. It would be useful to use a marker gene to see which of these has taken up the desired gene. So look at the textbook, page 134, and do activity 5.17 on page 134 of the textbook, and 5.18 on the textbook, page 136. Okay, so here you can see all of these are cloned plants. They're cloned from this one plant that took up the gene and became genetically modified. All of these would be thrown away because there's no use growing them. And then you just get many thousands of cloned plants that are also genetically modified. I've spoken about golden rice. So there's some golden rice versus normal rice. Um, and another gene was added to this rice to increase its iron content to help prevent anemia. Insect repelling crops such as potato plants um, to repel the insects that try and feed on them. Okay, that's enough for today.